Well, he joined season three of Netflix's Glow as brand new character, drag performer Bobby Barnes, and absolutely stole the show. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and with me is Kevin Cahoon. Thank you so much for talking with me, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I know this character, Bobby, is fantastic. For a second, though, I'm gonna, I want to take a walk back in time with you because you have this amazing story that I love because you were once on Broadway in The Lion King had a great, what most people would say, like, I have an awesome steady role in, like, the hit show, and I'm going to keep that Broadway gig going. But you left The Lion King, infamously, to go be John Cameron Mitchell's standby in Hedwig and the Angry Inch when it was at Jane Street. So what, like, what prompted you to do that? What made you take that huge leap? Okay. Well, I had been hearing about Hedwig and the Angry Inch, um, it was at West Beth before it moved to Jane Street. They weren't show, sure if the show was going to have a life. Um, but John was doing seven shows in the week, and they wanted to add someone to do the eighth and to stand by for him. So I went to see the show on my night off from The Lion King. And uh, the next day I said to my agent, I've got to be a part of this show somehow, somewhere, help me. My agents called over. They said, no, we don't feel like he's the right type for this. So I took my headshot myself. I don't know where I, <laughs> I uh, got the gumption to do this with a post-it note. And I took it to Bernie Telsey's office and I put it on the reception desk. And I just said, C for Hedwig. <laughs> and then I got the appointment. And um, I ended up auditioning for Peter Askin, who was the director, and Stephen Trask. And uh, I got it. Um, then I was faced with the decision okay, now you have to leave The Lion King. We were in the first year of its run, and it, you know, it was the biggest show of its time, if not ever. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to go stand by off-Broadway for a show that may not run. It was, um, I think it was $400 a week was the paycheck. And it a lot of, my agents at the time said, you're, you're nuts. You're losing your mind. What are you doing? I just have to do it. This show, this character, it has spoken to me in a way nothing else has ever spoken to me. It's a benchmark moment in musical theater and in telling stories of LGBTQ people that were, you know, disenfranchised. And I just thought, take this risk. Take the risk, take the leap. And so I did it. I did not re-sign my Lion King contract, Had We in the Angry Inch, you know, continues to be to this day, the gift of all gifts that has given me so many things in my life and in my career. And, um, you know, and I'm not saying I wasn't nervous to leave like to go. <laughs> well, if this runs a month, then I've given up my, my role in this steady paycheck and steady job. Um, and I love the Lion King and I love the people and I love the role. And it was, you know, one of the greatest, greatest gifts of my life, but I just thought, jump off the cliff, you know, take the ticket. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it certainly turned out well for you. Um, part of a cultural phenomenon, really, with that. And drag, basically, you know, both of Bobby and that role are, you're getting into drag for them. And I'm curious, were, had you performed in drag at all? What was your relationship like to that art form? I hadn't really. Hedwig was the first time that I had ever performed in drag or had been in drag. Um, and then it sort of opened this door for the rest of my life, which is <laughs> yeah. spectacular. And, you know, I've done Rocky Horror a number of times. I did The Wedding Singer on Broadway. And then Bobby Barnes showed up. And um, Hedwig and Bobby Barnes were, are both similar characters, that they are fighting and climbing every bit of every wrong they can find to land on their feet yeah. and they they just have obstacle 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 so when i got the sides for bobby barnes for the audition i i i understood it i understood yeah. it yeah but i did learn some new drag techniques for glow that i did not know for hedwig <laughs> um I learned tucking for the first time taping pull, I mean, underneath the clothes of the wig i was taped and glued and stapled and everything you can imagine the yeah. team did an incredible job at glow the hair and makeup department just killed it they killed it and beth morgan created those incredible costumes and 
you know, I just had to show up and they just put me in it. But I have such admiration and respect for those queens who do this on a nightly basis yeah. around the world by themselves. You know, they don't have Christina Frisch and Michelle Chandler and Valerie Jackson doing it for them. It's them. Yeah. So. Well, speaking of their tricks, I was wondering because Glow's obviously said in the 80s, we're in Las Vegas. Um, did you discover anything and maybe in doing like research about like the ways that drag has kind of changed? Because I, I feel like the style has certainly blown up in popularity, but how do you think it's changed over time? Well, I read this book by Dennis McBride called Out of the Neon Closet, which is all about the history of LGBTQ people in the state of Nevada and in Las Vegas. And it was really, really a helpful tool in, you know, Bobby has a, a son, um, he's single, he's, some would say, closeted, um, and those performers were up against so much homophobia. Kenny Kerr uh, is who the character is loosely based on, who had an incredible Las Vegas career, but they never let him play uh, the showroom, the main room. He was packing his little theater for three performances a night. Um, but the homophobia, you know, was there with the club mm -hmm. owner. And it it's interesting because all of these people were packing these theaters to see them, but yet they weren't willing to accept them for who they were, yeah. which is, is interesting. And I find I've kind of Boylesque was a huge show in Las Vegas at the time, which was very popular. And if you look at the footage from those shows and you look at old talk shows, I watched Donahue and Sally Jesse Raphael and a lot of the performers were on there and they are, um, they would start the show as whoever they were impersonating and it would slowly sort of fall away and they would do their own act. They would become their own, their own creations. And I thought, oh, isn't that a beautiful metaphor that Liza Minnelli and Carol Channing and Barbara Streisand and these people were gateways for these performers to get on the stage and then just be who they are. And I just thought they were sort of these beacons of light guiding these performers to their to their truth. I wanted to ask about the, those three women you mentioned are the three kind of impersonations that Bobby does. Um, when we, we first meet him in episode four, uh, Say Yes, uh, written by Isaac Oliver. And, you know, did you, I, I was wondering, did you pitch those for those ones that you had like in your repertoire or were those already in the script? Well, Isaac Oliver is a genius, let's just say that. He wrote episode four, and Rachel Shukert wrote episode nine, which Avita Perone is part mm -hmm. of. Um, and they are both brilliant. They're both brilliant, and they captured, they captured Bobby. But I will say, for the audition, they said, please come in or make a tape with three female impersonations. And that's not something that I do. So I thought, okay, who sings low? <laughs> and I went on YouTube, and I sort of found the icons of 1985. So for my audition, I did Carol Channing, Cher, Loretta Lynn, um, uh, Tammy Faye Baker, which I thought <laughs> was an interesting, an interesting uh, person to throw into the mix. And so Liz Flayhive and Carly Mensch, who were the creators and showrunners, their idea was Liza Minnelli. They wanted me to do Say Yes from Liza with a Z. Um, and I think since I did Carol Channing for the audition, they thought, oh, let's find a spot for Carol. Um, and Barbara Streisand was completely their creation as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> right, as I mentioned, thought of Avita Perone. And so, yeah. Um, one of my absolute, uh, two of my absolute favorite moments of the whole season um, are your moments with Sheila, um, who's mm -hmm. played by Gail Ranking, and it's because she's she's the she-wolf, she's always in this wolf thing, she has this like um, very angry mode that she's in often, but Bobby sees her and it's like the first time someone has ever actually seen her before, and then you have that moment backstage where she allows him to take off the wig and brush his hair. And there's just like hardly any dialogue between the two of you, but it's such a beautiful, tender moment of connection. How did you approach that scene? Well, Gail and I were friends before because we did our town together at the Williamstown Theater Festival, maybe 12 or 13 years ago. So we were friends. So we started out on a friendly, uh, a friendly footing already. And 
you know, what's interesting is that we did not talk a lot about it. We just sort of played the given circumstances for the first time on the set. And, you know, I think back to it and I don't even remember, I, I don't even remember Claire Scanlon who directed the episode so beautifully, don't even remember her saying action. I think it just, I think she said, okay, we're ready. And we just started and, you know, there were a lot of takes where we continued to ad lib, ad -lib and uh, create the dialogue. Um, but what they used was what was scripted, but I, I it was just a magical, magical pairing. And their writing is so beautiful in that Bobby Barnes is sort of a catalyst for Sheila's liberation from what she was hiding behind because she sees him as so liberated but at the same time he doesn't see himself as liberated um he sort of functions that way with bash with chris lowell's character too like it awakens something in him and it allows it just the writing was just extraordinary yeah it, I, i'm glad you mentioned bash because i felt like bobby in a way sort of served as this parallel or mirror image to him um because obviously there's lots of homophobia during that period, but Bash is extremely, extremely closeted. And it seems like, it almost seems like Bobby's trying to like offer him a way out, a way not to be. What, what do you think makes Bobby a little bit more comfortable with himself in that era? Well, I think Bobby is hungry and I think Bobby is gonna do what he has to do to play the big showroom. So there's that first scene uh, that I have with Bash where, um, Kate Nash's character and I, we come into the hotel room and I touch his leg and, mm -hmm. you know, it's such a beautiful job of recoiling because Bobby thinks that, you know, he's closeted and this is just some, you know, a relationship that they can have on the side. Um, and you, the panic and the terror in Bash's face and uh, it's just, and then Bobby sings Say Yes to him towards the end of the episode. Um, and then Bash says no. And it's just, you know, Bobby thought, oh, I have a I have a partner in crime here. Like I have someone who can help me get to where I need to get. And no, that door was not open. The door slammed in his face. So Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a heartbreaking moment. Um, it's hard. And yeah. He deals with a lot of I mean, there's obviously the homophobia that's going on. There's a hate crime that um is that his fundraiser, they try to light the place on fire. Um, you know, at that time, the AIDS crisis would have been hitting the gay community. So how do you think, um, how do you think Bobby kind of like channels all those really awful things that happened to him because he lives with such joy, or at least that's what he presents? Right, I think he's putting on good face. I think it's another, it's 1985, so I'm sure his friends are mysteriously you know, passing away around him. Um, he has a son. He is a single father. He's worrying about providing for that son. Um, and they, you know, that is based on a true story that they did. They did burn down um, a gay bar and a gay club in Las Vegas at the time. And it was a devastating the theater. It was a devastating blow to the community. Um, so that's based in truth. And I just feel like he's a survivor he is a survivor and he was going to do what he had to do and if that means putting on a happy face and putting up that armor and putting up that shield um that's what he was going to have to do but i think the stakes are really high for him because his friends are dying around him is he next you know that's a that's a big question um yeah so it's about armor i think mm -hmm. so yeah, one of the things I've always really loved about GLOW from the beginning is that they are very kind of committed to telling stories about women or marginalized people, but within the context of the time period they've chosen. You know, like, right. they can't just all of a sudden stand up and, like, be liberated because that didn't happen yet. Um, so do you, do you feel that they, like, achieved that and, not, like, tackled that with the gay community? Absolutely. I mean, it was before you know, marriage equality, of course, and definitely before, you know, even don't ask, don't tell, like it was 
really was people on the margins that people were paying top dollar to come see. And it's interesting, I mentioned the Donahue clips that I watched. Those performers, when they were on Donahue, would say, oh, this is just a uniform I wear. Like if I was a policeman or if I was a chef or a doctor, this is what I put on to go to work. There was not a sense of uh, claiming it and empowering it. And in the drag world today, you, it's empowered. You know, it's empowered. It's liberated. It's this is who I am and I'm proud of it. And it's they really paved the way. They really were the ground breakers, those performers at Boylesque and Vegas. And, you know, they they chipped that ceiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the more uh, fabulous co-stars you get to perform with is Gina Davis. And not just Gina Davis, you get Gina Davis in this epic Bob Mackey outfit on stage. Um, what was, I mean, she's an icon. What was that experience like working with her? She is everything you want her to be. And she really is. I mean, she is, you know, when I heard it was Gina Davis that was going to play Sandy, I could not believe it. And I remember the first day we had very early calls. I had very early calls because it took a long time to get <laughs> to my look. And she was at one end of the makeup trailer and I was at the other and I didn't, you know, I was just, I didn't want to say anything. And from the other end of the makeup trailer, she was like, is that my Bobby Barnes? Is that my Bobby Barnes? Get over here. And it was so immediately warm and welcoming and wonderful that, you know, we really created this fabulous kinship. The entire cast was so welcoming. Like the first week they asked me to go out dancing at Akbar in LA and they really took me in as one of their own. And I, I really was so grateful. And you know, Gina and I had that musical number in episode nine, and um, we had dance rehearsals together. Marguerite Derricks is a brilliant choreographer, and we had dance rehearsals together, and I'm in character shoes, and so is she, which is something we're not normally wearing, and she's wearing that incredible Bob Mackie, like, Las Vegas showgirl feather thing, which was very heavy. And, you know, we really... Um, we really had a kinship, and I, it's one of the great gifts of my career so far. I'm, I'm so grateful for that, and yeah. you know, it, it's a thrill. It was a dream. It was a dream. Um, I got. Uh, I just am curious before I let you go if this applies to you too, because I um, got to talk to Betty Gilpin, and she mm -hmm. she mentioned that like a lot of acting jobs might ask you to do like two percent or five percent of what you can do, but Glow always asks you to do a hundred percent because there's <laughs> it's such a full show like it does comedy and drama and the women have wrestling but like for you that would be singing and drag and, and the dance rehearsals so how yeah. does it compare like how, how does it compare to other jobs in the spectrum well it's funny because uh betty and i have got to do nurse jackie together mm -hmm. and um, i played thor's husband on nurse jackie and um of course she was uh, a regular on there and we talked about that on Glow. We were like, wow, those days were cake compared to, you know, the, what was called for with the wrestling and the performance aspects. And we shot all of those major episode four drag sequences all in one day. We did Carol Channing, we did Barbara Streisand, and then we did Liza Minnelli. So that was like a 5 a.m. to midnight day. And it was a full, a full take everything off and put a whole new thing on. Um, it was, so it was demanding, but when you're doing something that you feel so honored to do and that you are so in love with, you don't think about that. You don't think about the hard part. You don't even, you don't even think, you know, the next morning I did wake up from doing that full day and it was smoke and I had to smoke and my voice was really very, very in the basement. Um, and I had to do a whole book of warm up so I could be ready for the next day. But it was that morning when I woke up that I thought, oh, wow you really, you put yourself through the ringer, but I don't care. I mean, I do it every day, please. Yeah. To get this role on this show where everyone is at the top of their game, a show that I loved before I even got the audition, it just, I'm, it was a dream. It was totally, totally a dream and an honor. Well, it all turned out really well. It's a fantastic job. 
on the show. Um, everyone who's out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep up to date with us throughout any season. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me. Bam, thank you. I appreciate it.